my name's Craig Mould, uh, farm three miles, two and a half miles southeast of Rush City, Minnesota, about 50 miles north of Twin Cities. My dad bought the farm in 1954 and started with, with nothing. <laughs> That's the year I was born, actually, so. I've been here my whole life, so I've only moved down the road a short, and then moved back here, and so I haven't gone a long, long ways. Yeah, and I'm Andre Mould, and I've been here all my life, pretty much, so. So we farm, it's just under a thousand acres now, I guess, so, and it's split between corn and beans. You know, and there's some other land that's not farmable, you know, so you'd be up up to 1,200 to 1,300 yeah. acres, I suppose. Milk cows for, I milk cows for 40 plus years until my health wouldn't let me do it. Andre, about 10 years, 10 to 12 years, he milked and we transitioned out of the milking and went into raising heifers replacement heifers, and then I'll transition from that into steers, selling steers, and then transition from that just to crop farming. So, we did sell hay for a few years. Yeah, we sold hay for a few years. Um, so now we've exclusively been corn and beans since about 2005, 2006 probably. Originally, it was a dairy area. You know, everybody had 80 acres or 120 acres. That was our original farm was 120 acres and 35 cows. Um, my dad, I had two sisters that were seven and eight years older than, than me. So he raised us three kids on that, sent two of them to college on just 120 acres and 35 cows. Although he did run a feed mill for a couple of years too for extra income but that shows you the difference now you know we have to have a thousand acres just for two families you know and with no debt I mean it's just that's how things have changed over the years. Generally we have a little too much water that we're trying to get rid of you know but, you know, it, it, year by year, you know, it, this, it really varies. This year so. we're in a deficit. We're in a small area here that just, we've had enough to keep things going, but there's no surplus and just been waiting on the next half inch or the next quarter inch to keep things, mm -hmm. keep things going. We started out really wet, but then it just shut off in June. It just turned off and we just been getting enough you know, to, to basically make it. Um, and, you know, seeing that we're so far north, we're basically on the northern edge of the Corn Belt. We only have a week, maybe two weeks of time frame, you know, before we start losing yield because our days get shorter and we don't wanna, we don't wanna keep Jack Frost away as long as we can. We don't have the luxury of you know, delayed planting and things like that. And once it once it hits the fifteenth of May, you better be almost done or close to done with corn. And we don't like to plant soybeans in in June. We did one year, and it never we shouldn't have, I guess. And what was it? Twenty miles north of us, you can't get crop insurance for corn. So we're kind on the threshold of where you can actually plant corn you know, for, you know, a cash crop. So We've got a variety of soil types within yeah. field and field to field. Within fields. Yeah. We've got one field that we rent. It's blow sand on one end and it's peat on the other. And it's everything in between in about, what is it, a, less than a quarter mile. So you have, there's clay in between and it, 
yeah, it's just everything. So I know we used to host the seed day out here where we had the co-op used to plant a lot of different varieties and different maturities. And the seed reps that would come up here would be from Southern Minnesota or wherever. And they would always tell, tell us to make us feel good maybe, but they always said, you know, you guys up here, you got to be better farmers than the guys down south because you have a lot more thrown at you every year than than anybody. He says, I don't know how you even do it, they say, you know, so. We had in the back of our mind, we'd like to do less tillage, but looking back and seeing how people had failed trying to do that, uh, you know, you can't afford two or three years of poor yields just to get to where you want to get to. Right. And this was a transition, we thought, to take the variables out. I had a two-bottom plow behind the Z Moline, and I was seven years old. And my dad had a U Moline with three sixteens behind it plow. And we'd go plowing in between chores and if we could get 10 acres plowed in a day we thought we were really you know hoofing it i mean we had got a lot of things done in that time and then as the years progressed we got a little larger tractors and got you know six bottom plow whatever um two six bottom plows and a seven bottom but then we'd go out and we'd have to disc it that was my job to disc it and when I got done, if my dad looked out and he saw a corn stalk sticking up yet, he said, you missed that corn stalk. He said, you should really go out there and knock that down before we plant again. And it was a hard transition for me at first to switch to this minimum till just because of how I was raised. You know, you had to have it just black when it wasn't black it was brown but you know no residue on it. well we called it trash no residue at that time and the first year that we had the accelerator Andre went out and went corner wise on there and I looked at that field and I said that's not gonna work <laughs> you know we're not gonna be able to do it and we got done with it and I actually was surprised. I went in there and started planting and it went fairly good. We had some problems with that other planter, but went fairly good um, planting beans into those corn stalks. But I sent pictures to my daughter, Jennifer, and I said, there's no way those beans are gonna come up through all that stuff. And then it was just solid mat. It had to be 75 to 85%. I would guess pretty much residue cover on that. And she told me, she said, just go on vacation for a couple of weeks or don't look when you drive by. She said, they'll come up. And sure enough, they did come up after, you know. But So that was quite a learning experience being that old and, and doing that. I don't know for Andre if it was that hard he kind of it, pushed it it was more. concerning the kids <laughs> the two kids pushed it more than than i was willing i don't know if i would have done it on my own to go quite that drastic of a step but. over the long term it's work it's been like six years now and i know jennifer's been out there and said the soil structure well we can feel the soil structure has improved and uh, the recycling now of the nutrients. Uh, you go out there now in the bean field and if it was say 75 percent residue you go out there now and it's what maybe 30, 35 that it's cycling that fast now. Once the soil surface and down a few inches once that got going like working like it's supposed to work it decomposed everything quickly and basically that's why we haven't gone to a chopping head or anything like that because it, it cycles so fast that you, we don't see a need for it right away, you know. Um, and we've reduced a lot of our fuel 
usage yeah. and the time out there and it saves on the uh, hours on our equipment so we can don't have to trade equipment as often yeah and that's you know and the upkeep is quite a bit lower yeah taking the heavy tillage out especially the deep ripping we did that a few years to get rid of our plow pan that we had from the moldboard plow that was down eight inches so we were down 12 inches it took a lot of horsepower to get to pull that um didn't do every field we did a few fields just to get the compaction out and um it it does cost money to go over with the accelerator you know they're not cheap and it takes some horsepower at eight miles an hour to pull that but it doesn't take near what it took it takes less than a half a gallon i think an acre an acre where deep ripping uh took over three quarters of a gallon an acre and it was very slow because it was only what 14 and a half feet yeah we couldn't do 10 acres an hour and now with this one you do 25 25, acres, 25 acres an hour and we're at basically it's almost about the same amount of fuel as our fuel cultivator and we're still doing more acres per hour with a 25 foot piece of equipment compared to a 28 foot fuel cultivator because we're doing about 20 acres an hour with a 28 foot piece of equipment at five and a half to maybe six miles an hour whereas we're eight to maybe eight and a half miles an hour with the 25 foot piece of equipment and we're pretty close to the same amount of gallons per acre for fuel so we're we're just basically saving time and <clears throat> the other thing is with that piece of tillage equipment the accelerator it has down pressure on the wings so if it gets wet it actually it holds the piece of equipment up out of the wet spots whereas with the field cultivator you'd either the wing would dive down into the puddle or the center section would sink you know so it it just kind of holds it kind of at a at a nice level you know it keeps it level with the field so plus the maintenance yes. on the ripper and on the you know those ripper points the large ones they're like 125 dollars a piece and the last time we did the field cultivator just for the the shovels for that field cultivator it was 750 dollars and then we had to change them ourselves which you know took took some time to do also so that would that you had to do that every year you had to replace them every year but the accelerator not gonna we haven't touched it yeah you know it's yeah it has self-sharpening blades they stay not as sharp as from the factory but they they do stay sharp unlike a disc that rounds off because you're pulling it sideways through there and we, this is like a knife we must have what 12 to fifteen thousand acres on that thing now at least yeah so uh this is a kuhn kraus accelerator um we switched to this after we used a conventional disc and pulling a brilliant packer behind it because we were actually only going or tilling about two to three inches anyways with a conventional disc and they don't really work that well you know doing something like that so it was, we were using it kind of like a half measure anyways mm -hmm. So then when they came out with this, we moved to this because it has a shallower gang angle so it didn't scour the ground as much and put in so much of a hard pan underneath. Mm. So, and it actually has a um, shallower or a closer 
disc placement, which is, this is a, I think a seven to seven and a half inch spacing. And the front disc, the front gang, actually goes in between if you go from the front and look. So it splits it to like a three and a half inch gap. <clears throat> and I think this is only like a three quarter inch dish on this, um, on the actual disc, where the other one, or a normal disc is like a two inch, you know, um, dish on it. So it doesn't scour like the conventional type. And it, seem, it seems to work for us. Well, this is the planter that we use. Um, you start up front, you have your, they call them trash whippers, residue for residue management. Um, we run ours all the way up. We don't like to move a lot of residue. We move just enough. So as you go, that these wheels are riding on a firm base and they're not jumping around. Um, liquid fertilizer is put in two inches to the side and two inches below the seed. And that's changed. It's closer to the planter unit, so it's more precise. The older ones are way out front, so once in a while you get a long ways from the, from the seed. Or you could get right in the seed trench, which wasn't good either. So, And closing wheels, this is what closes your trench. And then your firming wheel that firms the soil. So it's pretty basic, but it works. And we have liquid fertilizer, um, 10 gallons, 9 to 10 gallons an acre. We put on that, and then of course the seed hoppers in the back. So we can we can plant uh, 250 acres without refilling seed, and 50 acres before we have to refill fertilizer. So planting goes, in our estimation, planting goes pretty quick. We can do 25, average 25 acres an hour basically when we get going so and beans are faster yet because we don't have to stop for fertilizer just go, so. said, that's the difference i said if your fields are smooth to start with you can go faster because it doesn't knock the seed off the seed disc because they're going up and down yeah or you know changing you know like that and that's what the vertical till did we vertical till at eight miles an hour and going that fast it it smooths it out tremendously so when i come with the planter you know it's it's really smooth so you're able to do that without your your uh, seed you know bouncing around and, and stuff like that so mm. yeah and then we have we hire our spraying spray. gun um we figure we don't have enough acres for self-propelled. But they comment. And they come and they comment that how smooth the fields are and how they're able to get in there right away after a rain, you know, because it's, and they're able to go faster and stay on the road. So that's what we found. It's just, it's, the soil structure has been set up now. It took time, but it's set up enough now where you know, it's comparable to the no-till when they go in, when they drive in, they don't sink. Where years earlier, they would drive in on a wet year and they would basically sink as far as you've tilled. And so that's another benefit. Um, the benefit over no-till is you get to smooth it off every year. You know, where no-till, once you, once you get a rough field with no-till, you got a rough field basically forever and this tool you can incorporate fertilizer with oh that's what we do yeah, yeah. yeah. as opposed to no-till yeah, you're right right so it doesn't lay on top fertilizer right it's some. basically the reason that we do because otherwise we could go no-till but we need to incorporate the fertilizer you know 
because we don't know, you know, if we're going to get the rain because we don't have any pivots, you know, and, and stuff like that. So. And that was the quickest way we found to do it with a two-man operation. Right. So. And we don't, you know, we we don't farm as many acres as we used to, but you know, for two guys in a thousand acres and get it done in a a week, you know, we figure that's about as quick as you can ask for. Uh, you know, we shoot for 200 bushel. Some years we average more than that, some years we average less. Just depends on the weather, but I mean, it's attainable. Our APH shows it mm -hmm. it's attainable. Our philosophy is, you know, we look at the price of fertilizer <clears throat> and the price of corn and determine basically, you know, what rate is the most economical for us to do. I mean, we're not shooting for 250 bushel corn and fertilizing for 250 <clears throat> bushel corn because we might get it because that's an easy way of going broke <laughs> I think <laughs> you know we look to see what's you know what we know in a normal year what we can raise and that's what we use for our recommendations and that's what we stick to you know there are some fields where it will go higher but consistently it's it's really tough without basically buying those last bushels with the inputs. I think basically we were going for erosion resistance rather than anything else. Mm -hmm. right. So keeping keeping your money where you put it, keeping the money in the field rather than sending it down the waterway or into the neighbor's field or wherever. You just, you put your money in your field and you keep your soil in your field and keep your money where it's productive. Before we plant, before we go with the accelerator, we'll spread a base amount down just in case we can't get in when we need to. And then on the planter, we put between nine and 10 gallons of starter, two by two, um, down. And then once the corn gets to V4 to V6, V5, right in that area, depends on the year, depends on the forecast. We come in and, and top dress, and that has a <coughs> factor that's an inhibitor to keep it from volatilizing. And you have two weeks before you start losing any any nitrogen. So we try to time it when there's a rain coming if we can, um, just to make sure that it gets rained in. And so far, I, last year, not this spring, but the spring before, it laid out there about 20 some days before we got a rain, but I don't think we lost any. I think it, you know, it, it's pretty good to have those inhibitors. You know, if you're gonna lay it on top of the ground and even the stuff we put down first was Super U and that has both inhibitors for leaching and volatilization. So and that's a big thing if you put down urea, plain urea, early in the season, and you get a wet season, and you get six or eight inches of rain before that corn is able to use that, it'll flush it out of the root zone, and it'll never be available. So this holds it in place, so that's made a big difference on why we, we do it that way, and it's fast. I mean, you can do, <clears throat> you can spread all your acres, you know, in one day, basically, or a day and a half, you know, and with two people, it's a lot easier. You're not hauling a lot of product back and forth and this and that. Um, although, you know, when, when you spread fertilizer, you don't always get it in the corners or you don't want to throw it out into the ditch, you know? So when you, when you side dress, you get it right out to that edge roll, but, they have new spinners now on these new um, spreaders that are able to actually drop it within an inch or two at the end and have a uniform spread all the way across. So, and I guess I don't care if the end edge rows are a little bit shorter than the other ones anyway, because then it's a bigger surprise when you get in there and <laughs> you open it up and it's like, wow. So,
initially I mentioned just getting your mind wrapped around going out in that field and mm -hmm. planting something and you know when you're used to having you know something that's not totally void of residue but a lot less residue when you go into something and you know you can't hardly tell where you're going or where you've been in the field it's for an old guy like me it was something to get used to so i'm used to it now it doesn't bother me now i'm i'm not afraid to go out there now and do it but we do our pre we did a pre this year on spraying the first time and when you do a pre you have to come out you have to spray it before the beans are up and we have the the co-op do our spraying and he came out in the field and he parked on the corner of the field and he called me he said i can't see because they usually follow the planter rows he said i can't see where to even go here he said i don't see any rows or anything so he set his gps at a slight angle and just went back and forth and got it sprayed but yeah, there's all, always one you can't get in there. Mother Nature bass last all the time. <laughs> yes. Yeah, she, that's, so. that's the big variable. We try to cover all all the bases and try to do all the, cover all the variables we can. Yeah. You know, but it's the weather that trumps everything, basically. Mm -hmm. And I could see us moving to no-till soybeans in the corn stalks first. <sighs> right. And then at some point possibly no tilling everything um, depending on the year of course um, some people that intended to no till this year actually went out and just lightly mm -hmm. till the soil the same way as this does just to get it to dry out so they can plant mm -hmm. you know because you don't want the planter gumming up with with mud because then things don't work you only get one shot to plant and if you don't do it right, I guarantee you, we don't have time here to come back and replant because our window is so short and our season's so short here. Down south, if they, if the first <coughs> planting's a failure, they have time to go back in, plant it again where we don't. I did that one year, probably 20 years ago, where we had a frost in late well, it was about the middle of June and it froze it off and they said, you know, it buggy whipped and they said it won't come back. It was about that tall. It was a late spring anyway, but it's about that tall. So I took the field cultivator out there in that 80 acre field and went diagonal and ripped up the corn. Some of the corn was this tall, some was that tall. That was a sick feeling going out there and ripping that up. Anyway, my dad said, why don't you leave 10 acres on the edge, he said, to see what the difference is. So we left 10 acres out of that 80. So we replanted 70 acres, went in the next day and planted the corn. Corn came up in two days, and it was just off to the races. It came up, it came up. Pretty soon it got to the same height as that corn that we had planted earlier, and actually exceeded the height of the corn that we originally had. Plus the stand was better, it was perfect. We come with the combine that fall and there was 25 bushel difference between the corn that we left standing and the new corn and it was the corn that we left standing that was better than that that new corn that came up just because we ran out of gtus yeah. you know it would have made great silage if you needed silage but mm -hmm. it just didn't make corn so that's what we're up against here that you know you you don't know what's what's coming basically yeah. this year we're gonna be trying some no-till on a few acres and some cover crops uh, we did have a cover crop the one year when we had some prevent plant and it was it was kind of interesting because the next year we had split a field we had a cover crop on part of the field and not the rest and two different fields. And the next year, the corn was about 10 bushel better where we had the cover crop. And the beans are about two, two and a half bushel better where the cover crop had been. You know, so it, we saw some benefits of it. Um, but that was planted 
like the first part of August, I believe it was, because we didn't have anything else to do. Going forward, we're looking into putting cover crops in after corn. And up here, you know, that's into November, you know, so we don't know how that's going to work if we're going to get enough growth by next year when it comes time to plant the beans. You know, we're going to see how how much benefit we actually get from it. You know, it'll be a learning experience for us, I guess. No-tilling corn up here is a little trickier. Well, we have to incorporate the fertilizer. Right. And that's our issue with no-tilling corn to incorporate the fertilizer. So that's where our biggest leap would be. We would have to increase our two by two gallons per acre to do that. And I don't know if that'd be cost effective or, or not because yeah. liquid fertilizer is so much more expensive. And I know this year guys have put on 28% liquid. It was a lot more expensive than mm -hmm. dry. Um, so every year is different. And, and then if you side dress, they're 30 gallons per acre with liquid. 30 to 50. 30 to 50, right. <clears throat> so, I mean, that's just a lot of liquid on its own. So... To be transported. And yeah, it, it's actually slower, it can be slower than planting if you don't have the infrastructure to move the fertilizer. And if it's a wet year like it has been a few years. Yep. You get a thousand or fifteen hundred gallon tank, you know, full, and your tractor, and you're driving every forty feet. You're putting in compaction quite a bit. You're out there when you shouldn't be, but you're out because you have to be. Whereas with the dry spreader, it's every eighty or ninety feet, so you're putting in half the half the compaction on that second trip across the field. Right, and they actually, there's less compaction with a large floater like that than there is with a tractor with a, you know, with a, a rig, liquid rig. Our operation, everything is contiguous. There's, you have to cross the road and that's about it a little ways, um, which makes it nice for a two-man operation. So all of the water that leaves the farm is actually either goes, has to go through a buffer or go through a wetland. Yeah, we did, in 2007, we did a 55-acre wetland restoration in one of our fields that were, there were a lot of ditches through it and small, irregular shaped fields. And Jennifer, our daughter, working at the local, uh, Soil and Water District at that time suggested that we maybe want to look into that selling or putting it into a wetland uh, for credits and stuff. And that that was a good decision. We took it out of production and it's gotten back to what it was, you know, originally basically. So, and it's helped. So the Southern half of our watershed of our acres goes through that wetland and it's amazing to see when it crosses underneath the road through the culvert on the other side of the road, it looks like you could just go down there and just drink the water. I mean, it's just as clear as can be, you know, so it, it's doing its job, you know. And, and then on the other side, we have a, we found out that we have a public waterway that goes through our property. So we do have a um, buffer 30 foot buffer on each side of that, that's in CRP. And that's cleaned up the area a lot too over the years, so. The thing is the fall from our highest point to our lowest point is what a foot and a half. No, it's three or feet. three feet. Three feet, so it's not so, a lot of. Right, there's no velocity, you and, know. And it's all surface drainage, the, the few ditches right. we have, because before you get down you know, eight inches to a foot and you hit clay. Yep. And it's clay down 15 feet or probably further than that. 
agronomy, we have an agronomist at the local co-op here. Um, we work with, with him and sit down with him and determine, you know, how many pounds per acre, basically, like I said before, you know, for our, what we're trying to achieve. And then also our chemical program, different things to go through. Um, soil and water board, you know, for any, anything that's, um, you know, any regulatory things or anything to do with soil health, we go through them, they see what programs they have. NRCS has programs also there in the same office in North Grant, so it's kind of nice that they're both in the same area, so you can ask a question if one doesn't have a program the other one probably would and they and they actually work together sometimes they cost share i've seen a lot of that over the years being on the board you see all of these projects that go through and a lot of times there's cost share where one will pick up a portion and the other will pick up a portion and then we have the lake improvement association on the south end and they have taxing authority, so they have money, and they'll kick in the money. So a lot of these projects are 100% financed. It doesn't cost the landowner anything. You know, it used to be when I started, it would used to be 50-50 or 25-75 or whatever. And now there's a, most of these, you know, larger projects are 100% funded, you know, so... And, and I've always been a proponent of that because the water quality is for everybody, not just that landowner. Everybody's benefiting from it. So, yeah, you're using taxpayers' money to, to do it, but they're also benefiting in the long run. Or go to the field day for seed. They have a seed. Mm -hmm. we, we hosted a seed day for, I don't know, field day for I don't know how many years, 10 years, the local co-op. And then... We decided not to do it anymore. We just didn't want to do it anymore. And then it got picked up by a neighbor. Get a lot of information there. Um, I don't know, we do a lot of, on the internet basically is where you get a lot of it. Used to be magazines, but nothing against magazines. But by the time you get the magazine, you've already, you already saw it a month ago online and saw the article and, and read everything. Like that's the biggest one. You know, we used to go down the farm fest and look at the machinery and stuff in there. But that stuff has kind of gotten so large, it's, you know, they don't have a lot of the equipment that we would use on a thousand acre farm. Well, Basically the bigger ones. And their soil types are different than ours. Yeah. So it's, you know, when you compare soil types with other people that have the same soil types, you know, is, is the big, big thing because, you know, I mean, it just, you know, when, it, when you have a little more sand rather than more clay or whatever, it's just not a cookie cutter, you know, you just can't do the same thing everywhere, you know, it's just region by region. And I think there is a group of a few farmers that get together, um, that bounce ideas back and forth between them. Mm -hmm. you know and it, you do that when you go to a meeting or something you see what the neighbor's doing and you say so how's that working out for you and do your research you know um maybe talk to a neighbor or talk to somebody you know that has comparable soil types or you know I guess you know and and see and take small steps you know okay. because it gets real expensive real yeah. fast if you make a mistake or talk to the neighbor if they have a piece of equipment you would yes. like to try on your land maybe you can hire them to right to try it on a field yep. instead of going out and spending eighty to a hundred thousand dollars on a piece of equipment do it once or have them do it and pay them yep. just see how it works for you you know it's i think that's the easiest to go slow you know and you'll know when it's the right time to to make the switch because it 
you have to be ready for it in your mind. Mm -hmm. well, there's so many ways of doing the same thing. You know, you just have to, you know, maybe try a few different things and see what works for you. You know, and what works for us may not work for the neighbor. So it's just a trial and error, and hopefully it doesn't cost a lot of money and have a lot of failures. So, And you just don't jump in with all your acres one year and do right. something totally new. You typically want to do 10 to 15% of your acres and try it, see how that worked out. For more than can. one or two years because just because it doesn't work the one year doesn't mean it's not going to work, you know, two or three years down the road. I was on, I still am on the Soil and Water Board. I think that's where I first heard about it, um, being on the board, that this new program was, was coming out in the state. And, you know, and it, it appeared at that time that it was going to be really tough to qualify for it, you know, because there was quite a, quite a list of things you had to go through and, you know, to improve, try to improve what you're doing and things like that and just looking at it i thought yeah i don't know if we could you know we could get part way but we didn't know if we get all the way and i don't know if you reached out to us or how i don't remember how it ever came about that met with, with ryan and you know went through with some of that you know went through it and I know the first time he went through, he said, well, you're really close. He said, we, you know, just tweak a few things here. And, you know, and, it, and one of the things was <clears throat> with our APH that we had in this area was a little bit higher than what you were accustomed to. And we were in the Northeast quadrant of the state, which put us in the 130 bushel average. And we were at 190, 200. So naturally, we had to use a little more pounds of fertilizer per acre to get those returns. And that's what kind of kept us without using, I should say, the reason, the reason that we were able to do it was the split application and using these um, urease inhibitors and, and such like that and splitting everything so it wasn't all put on at one time mm -hmm. and then having the the actual production history to show that yeah it's actually going out in the truck in as corn you know it's not going down the river it's not being wasted well, and at that time i think we were still disking and we yeah, were using yep. the fuel cultivator also yeah so we didn't have nearly as much residue on the top because we were still disking and pulling a packer behind the disc. And that might have got us into this accelerator too, because yep. it was basically almost the same. We were doing, trying to do the same tillage practice, just with the wrong piece of equipment for what we were trying to use it for, <laughs> I guess. So then we, you know, Ryan, he recommended a few things. If we tweaked it, I don't know, your score had to be eight or something like that. Eight, and a, half, eight yeah. and a half or something like that. He <clears throat> said, so you're really close. Just tweak a few things. And we went and tweaked a few things. And then he, I got a letter and said, well, you've, you've been accepted because you've done those things. I don't know. What, what are you on your side? Yeah, like you mentioned, Craig, your score was real close to that eight and a half yeah. score that we needed. But in combination with the pretty well advanced nutrient management practices and and taking a deep dive into your crop history and seeing that you had good justification for the nitrogen right. rates that you were applying. And I think that's part of the reason why this program is good is that we can work with the farmer. It's not a one size fits all mm -hmm. type deal. So looking at that, um, the wetland restoration, the buffers, the sediment basins that you've installed all that stuff helped improve your score the last thing that was holding you back was the tillage 
and with the change to vertical mm -hmm. till you were well above that eight and a half so yeah all right it, it's a good program i mean it it gets you to look at what you're doing because you know you start you do things the same year every year and every year because it works but you're not looking at you know so how much phosphorus is really leaving you know the farm and when you start doing these projects and you start adding up you know the benefits of it it makes you feel kind of good i mean it's you know and i like i said i sit on the soil and water board and you know there was a time when i call them the lake people the people around the lake were pointing at the farmers this is why our lake is green well farmers are pointing at them yeah but you're mowing your your grass right down there and you're fertilizing and all this so there's a lot of pointing fingers and what I've seen over the years on the soil and water, I've been on 20 years now, my last year, um, what I've seen is people quit pointing their fingers and they're starting to work together. And a lot of that started when they started seeing the landowners, the farmers, taking the initiative to try to stop that from going into the lakes or into the rivers and the soil and water going out and saying, hey, you see what they've been doing, you know, they're trying, you know, you should, you should do that too. And I know around our lake area here, we've done multiple rain gardens and things along now that the landowners along the lake have done. And they're kind of getting into it now where they, before they thought it was an eyesore to have a, not to be, to mow right down to the edge. Kind of like us, not tilling everything, so it was just black. It was the same sort of deal. And it, it caught on, you had a few, if you targeted the right people, that people would look at, and you knew they were gonna do, do a good job. All of a sudden they said, yeah, we like that. I think we want one of those too. And I think that's what's gonna happen in the area of farming too, in our little area here, you know, most, most of us old guys are pretty much done, and the newer generation that's coming, they're looking at ways to improve. And it's, you know, it's kind of a peer pressure deal too, you know, where you drive by and you see somebody that's doing something you don't think is right, you know, you don't say anything to them, but after a while, you know, they, I think they come around, and I, I think they will, you know. Well. And, it, and really, if it affects the bottom line in a positive, you really can't argue no, with that. No, yeah, but everybody has to. Right. Everybody has to. Pitch in. Pitch in yep. and quit pointing fingers. Right. And that's what I've seen. I've seen yep. people that have been working together and getting results. I know the lakes in this area, mm -hmm. a lot of them have come off the impaired list now since we've been doing this stuff in the not because I've been on the board at all, but just the different things that have happened. Different over. mindsets. Yeah. Yep. yeah, it's just, and I, I think it's the younger people that are really pushing it. I say younger, you know, the next generation. I'm a middle is generation what, yeah, right now. Or who are, who are really pushing that, you know. And it's easier for them, I think, because they don't have bad ha old old bad habits. Yep. So. Craig, having been on the board, it was it was easy to explain the process to him. He understood our program and the way those types of things works. And I always see him at field days. They're always able and willing to learn new things. And I think uh, they've come a long way. And we appreciate their their efforts. Yeah, we're not done learning. Yeah, you never you always never learn something learning. when you go with these things. And and I will add that. You know, it was kind of a sticking point, you know, when we ran into that amount of fertilizer being used yeah. and everything. And I, you know, to your credit, you were able to kind of show, show them that, you know, not every farm is the same in that area. Mm -hmm. You know, if you can prove that you're doing things correctly and you're maybe a little bit outside the, the box that was originally mm -hmm. set, and I think that might open doors to more farms 
Hopefully. You know, just by doing that, if they can show that they're getting results. And the APH history, like you said, mm -hmm. yeah, you is, know, it's a huge, you know, with, with the records, mm -hmm. yeah, record keeping. Shows what's been if done. they can show that they were positively, you know, with the APH without the runoff, you know, mm -hmm. and, and stuff like that. Well, and you're using the products that protect that. Right, right. That yeah. nitrogen from leaving right. the, the environment. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, and I don't know how many, I call them large farms. There are a few large farms in the area. The problem we have and what they have is if they're set up for a certain type of system, you know, when you have to spend $100,000 on a piece of equipment to change it, yeah. it's kind of tough to swallow, you know, and not knowing what it's going to do. There's kind of two ways to look at it. The field scale practices like what you guys yeah. have done with the reduced tillage advanced yeah. nutrient management or keep those practices the way they've always been and do buffers and okay. sediment basins yes. and those type of things yeah. but if you're looking at ways to improve your bottom line i think the way you went is probably the better yeah, option that can be different for everybody. we did kind of throw the baby out with the bath water when we got rid of our disc yeah. But it, it was positive, so it, it, it was just kind of a scary step the first year. <laughs> so, yeah, you have to be willing to change, though. That's the thing. Your mindset, you know, and a lot of people think, like I said before, they try it one year. If it fails, it's like, well, that's never going to work. Right. You but know, it, it's a process. It's not a one size fits all. Right. And it's not a one year you just transition. No. To it. It's a four to five year transition. And that's why some of these programs where you can get so many dollars per acre, you know, through NRCS, soil and water, help that transition, help the farmer make that transition because they don't want to take that financial hit, but they can't. 